namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa homage to the blessed noble and perfectly enlightened one Namo Sadanto Suchedo Ye Olahudi San Miao San Putoshi Namo Sadanto Suchedo Ye Olahudi San Miao San Putoshi Wushang Shen Shen Wei Miao Fa Bai Chen Wang Che Nan Sao Yu Wo Jin Chen Wan De Shou Chi Yen Che Ru Lai Chen Shi Yi Supreme and Wondrous Dharma, Subtle and Profound rarely is encountered even in billions of eons. But now we see and hear it and accept it reverently. May we truly understand the Buddha's actual meaning. Indeed, welcome everyone. Nice to see you. We are, we have reached the 13th day of March here in Queensland, Australia, 12th day of March. Uh, in, uh, we're not quite to the Ides of March, uh, back in California, and we're not yet to St. Patrick's Day either. That's 17th? Sure, and Bigora. Yes, you don't have a drop of Irish blood in you there. <laughs> we're supposed to know St. Patrick's Day, so. But uh, there we are, and we're about to launch into our weekly investigation of the Flower Garland Sutra's 10 Stages chapter, and we're back in the Buddha Hall here at Gold Coast Dharma Realm with our team of volunteers, and our, our volunteers' daughters are here too, and the, uh, we're going to invite the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas of the Ten Directions in three periods of time to come and bless uh, all of us. Welcome. Uh, if you're listening from everywhere around the world, we have a translation into Mandarin happening. We have a translation into Vietnamese happening. So uh, all the conditions are here. We've had a spattering of rain which cleaned the air and uh, we're all ready to begin our Dharma request. So let's see here and then we'll once we put our screen up here we go this is what we're going to chant we chanted in Chinese and that's the translation for those of you who, who like me are still learning your Chinese. Here we go. Quite a lecture for you today, and let's get started. Oh, one more thing before we need to do first is we're going to acknowledge country, a new, new to to this monk uh, custom, familiar here in Australia, 
and I'm going to personally introduce this back in California when I've returned, and uh, we're going to replace the Kombumeri people in the Ugambe language group with the Homos and the Miwoks and the Ohlone people, who were the original first peoples of California. So, the Kombumeri people of the Ugambe, langu Ugambe language group practice their spiritual connections to land, to all creation and all living beings here in this location for thousands of years before white people were ever imagined. Today, we acknowledge them as the traditional custodians with gratitude that we share this land, with sorrow for the costs of that sharing, and with the hope that we can move to a place of justice and partnership together. We acknowledge their wisdom and their elders, past, present, and emerging. Indeed. Righty. Make some adjustments here. Okay, here's our text today. Right there, nice to see. We are going to, let's see here, let me decide two, three, we'll do three, three in a row, and then see how far we get. Okay, here we go. Chu Tsu Chu Di Jong. So da kung de wong yi fa hua jung sheng si xin wu sun hai. While they abide on the initial stage, they serve as kings of merit and virtue. They use the Dharma to teach all beings. Acting with compassion, they do no harm. Hong Ling Yen Fu Di, Hua Xing Mi Bu Ji, Che Ling Zhu Da She, Cheng Jiu Fu Zhi Hui. They rule over Jambudvipa. They teach and transform beings without exception. They enable those beings to abide in grand generosity and from there accomplish the Buddha's wisdom. Hmm. I know what I want to talk about when we get there. Yu Chou Zui Sheng Dao Shu Ji Guo Wang Wei Nang Yu Fu Jiao Zhong Yong Meng Qin Xiu Xi in their search for the highest path, they can renounce even a king's throne to cultivate with courage and diligence within the Buddha's teaching. Okay, here we are. Those are three of the verses from the, the uh, 10 stages chapter. And take a look as I scroll down, look where we are. We're nearly done, almost done. So one of, the, one of the, the challenges, one of the jobs today is to think about what we're gonna explain next. What's next in our, in our uh, program of weekly explorations into the sutras. I have one preference. Um, we'll talk about it later, but I'm open to suggestions should be focused on the Avatamsaka. Um, and if not directly the Avatamsaka, then the Chan school of the Mahayana. So keep that in mind. All right. So this is the uh, conclusion. We're at the end of the 10 stages, chapters, verses. And When we're in the first stage, well, see, 
I need to say that more precisely. We're at the end of the Okay. Uh-huh. We have a question. So I'll I'll work with that. Okay. We're at the the end of the verses to the first stage, not not the entire 10 stages. So we've been looking at the first stage of the 10 stages called the Huan Shi Di, the stage of happiness. Uh, topic is how a bodhisattva prepares to uh, embark, prepares to study all 10 stages, how to become a true, complete, uh, fully functioning bodhisattva according to the Flower Garland Sutra. And the first stage sets the foundation. It's the, where the basement is laid and the, the uh, pillars that is gonna hold up all 10 stages that follow. So the answer to, if you ask the question how, the answer is with generosity, with vows, with happiness. That's how. So take a look. While they abide on the initial stage, they serve as kings of merit and virtue. That word King Wang appears all through the sutras. Uh, because in India, where our historical Buddha lived, it was a monarchy. There were kings. They knew what a king was. There were lots of kings. There were 16 different states of India, and everyone had their own king. And royalty was a fact of life. Um, we know now uh, everybody's favorite monarch, Queen Elizabeth, bless her heart. Uh, Spain has a king. Sweden has a king. Um, you know, you can find them. They're still there. Uh, fewer and fewer. Uh, we do have dic dictators as well. Uh, and we have functioning democracies and wannabe democracies that don't function quite so well. So a king is what? The king is the first among equals. He's the, he's the number one. He's the, uh, under heaven, he alone is honored, they say, that's the king. And so in the sutra, the word king appears, what? To talk about a bodhisattva and say he's the best at something. He's the best. So he is the best at merit and virtue. What is, that's, what is that? That's what we call Buddhist code language. And uh, I have another series of talks that I give on Saturday mornings here in Australia, Friday afternoon in California. It's uh, on, currently we're explaining the Zheng Dao Ge, the Song of Awakening to the Way, the Song of Enlightenment. And we're really paying attention to the code, code language. Master Yongjia, the master from Yongjia, whose name was Shenjia, the, the one who put the Song of Enlightenment together, packs his verses with code, Buddhist code. You get the three of this and the seven of that. And you get uh, uh, all kinds of technical terms that without the decoder, when, and when I was growing up, it was Captain Midnight with his secret decoder ring. That was Captain Midnight. Did you do Captain Midnight here in Australia? Not so much. It was early days of TV, really crude. Uh, all those have been preserved on YouTube now. And oh man, the production values. Our standards, we weren't very demanding in our, in our reality demands for TV uh, entertainment. Captain Midnight, it was, the rockets were made of cardboard. You could see them, yeah, they were fun. Uh, his costume was made of cardboard. So he had a secret decoder ring, Captain Midnight. And with that decoder ring, he could understand. He, you hear the, the words being said and they sound like nonsense. Using the secret decoder ring, aha, the message is clear, aha. You know what to do. So. The Song of Enlightenment is jam-packed with Buddhist code. Here is an example of it in the Avatamsaka Sutra. Kings of merit and virtue. What is a king of merit and virtue? You have met people like that. In your life, you can have a king of merit and virtue of your family. 
What it means is somebody whose personality, whose character, whose, in Chinese they say, renpin, the quality of his humanity, is developed to uh, a state beyond ordinary people. When you, they talk, you listen. When they lead, you follow. When they make a decision, you agree. They have merit, they have virtue. When they do things, it works. It works out. It's the best plan. Why? That person could be dad, could be mom, could be grandma, could be grandpa, could be uncle, could be auntie, could be a stranger, could be the, super, the superintendent at your building, could be the mayor of your city, could be the president of your country who has a quality that is, puts them above other people. You just know it. You feel it. There is something about them. Um, our, my grand teacher, our teacher's uh, Dharma heir, Master Empty Cloud, Xu Yun Lao He had it. He had that quality. Uh, they say that he, from behind you could be touched by the quality of his character. That's merit and virtue. And a king just means in your community, that's the best one. Not always. Kings sometimes are rotten, you know. But, uh, just ask Shakespeare. Uh, but the... Um, here we're assuming that the king is the, the first, the best. So these bodhisattvas here on the first stage are already kings of merit and virtue. As Buddhists, what they were doing when they were practicing their religion, practicing their path, they were working on themselves. They were paying attention to their own character. So what that means is a chance to lie, they didn't. They told the truth chance to curse they didn't they held their tongue they made sure the words they spoke were blessings not harmful not hateful look at this these bodhisattvas used the Dharma to teach all beings oh man I remember how shocked I was the first time that I heard that there were teachers in our boys and girls school at City of 10,000 Buddhas who were wearing precept robes. They were monks, they were nuns in this case. And they threatened their students that if they didn't behave, they were going to go to hell. They were going to fall into the hells. Like that, you know, and, and with that, and these are moms who said their children, who were the students, came back from class and were just terrified because the nun had threatened them with spiritual violence. <laughs> and I thought, wait, wait, wait. That's not how you use the Buddha Dharma, especially with a child. You know, or is that actually happening? I didn't believe it at first. And Sure enough, I mean, I taught third grade. I know at some point you just think whatever works to get these kids to shut up. They aren't listening to me. I'm going to do whatever I have to do. Yeah, but you don't, you know, they're going to fall into the hills. So the bodhisattvas are different. What do they do? They use the Dharma to teach all beings. And acting with compassion, they do no harm. Hmm. May I say, can I hear an amen? Can I get a hallelujah? Hallelujah. Can I get a praise Buddha? Praise Buddha. Whew. Don't threaten people and hope that they're ever going to believe in the Buddha. If you use the Dharma as a punishment, they're going to go get baptized as soon as they can. Right? I mean, why threaten them with the Buddha? That's that seems like that's pretty short-sighted to me. Huh, you know. So maybe if you were kinder in your own heart and didn't send people to hell, maybe the students would listen spontaneously. You wouldn't have to threaten them. Anyway, acting with compassion, they do no harm. Yeah. Um, there's a wonderful uh, verse that talks about the shramana. I wonder if I can find that. 
Let's see here. Shramana verse. Let's see if that comes up. I would like to read that. I had it, I prepared it a couple months ago and then never used it. There it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There we go. Ooh. I want to exit full screen. Thank you. Okay. Did it come up? Shramana. Here it is. Right here. I'm going to share my screen again. This is, uh, here's an example. Come on. There we go. Click. Okay. Bang. Here we go. Uh, I have a translation for this one. So, Okay. Uh, check this out. This is a wonderful, this comes from the Agamas. Um, from the, the U Han Jing, you know, the early, early sutras that the Buddha shared. There we go. Okay. Uh, teaching, teaching for a different time, for a different quality of student. Here's what the Buddha said. He said, Hey, Shuli an ai, Chu jia xiu dao. Shuyuan Okay, what is it? it goes like this. Let me make it a little smaller here. Okay. Uh, it could be a man, could be a woman. She must set aside caring and love to leave home and cultivate the way. And familial love. There we go. The love of the family. And if you want to make it a female pronoun, that's fine. The rest. He subdues his senses, untouched by desires. Towards all, he is kind. He does no harm. Not elated by joy, not troubled by distress. Patient as the earth, he can take what comes. For this reason, he is called a Shramanerika. I adopted it for, uh, because there were younger monks and nuns, but we can, let's make it original. We call it Shramana. Okay. For this reason, she is called a Shramanerika. That's the female Shramana. Okay, there it is. Look at this. This is a thumbnail sketch of qualities that I would like to have in myself. And this is the Buddha's early description of what he thinks a monk should be, what a monk is like. Sets aside the caring of familial love. You have to do that if you're going to leave home and cultivate the way. And that's, that's a big deal. That's many of us would say, nope, can't do that. Don't want to do that. that I don't want to, I want to have heartbeats around me all my life. I want to go from my mother's kitchen to my wife's kitchen and not even notice, you know, guys say that. Or the woman who is uh, used to being dependent, I want to go from my father to my husband and be dependent. So. Most people do that. That's normal and healthy and good. But there are rare individuals throughout history. It's not for everybody. People say, what would you do if everybody left home? Humanity would stop. And my answer is, good luck trying to get everybody to leave home. Not everybody wants to do it, right? So these people want to do it. And then as they leave home, they subdue their senses, key, first thing it says there, the, the, the formula for leaving, for becoming a shramana, you have to challenge your eyes and tell them to ting hua, to listen to you. You can't just carelessly stare, to watch what your eyes are looking at. Your nose, your ears, your tongue, your body, your mind, you have to subdue them, not to beat them up, but to use them skillfully. Because meditation is right there. Success in meditation depends on what I do with my six senses, right? So, subdue my senses. Untouched by desires. 
the senses work freely in the world without sticking to certain sights like glue or hating certain sounds and loving others, right? Okay, what else? What's the formula? Towards all, he, she is kind. She does no harm. That key, I mean, apply that to, to the war at the moment, right? We just had a request to talk about how a Buddhist responds in a time of war. And uh, I, I have a lot to say about that, but I have to sit on myself to, not, to make sure that we're talking about the Dharma and not about political views. My views are not shared by everyone, but as I can speak as a Buddhist monk, that right here, if we can say, what should I do in order to affect the war in Yugoslavia? I'm, I'm sorry, oop, didn't, oop. typo, the war in Ukraine. The Yugoslavian war was a previous war. What do we do to, so that in my behavior I can directly affect what's going on in Ukraine, even though physically I may not be there? My answer is, be kind towards all and do no harm. If you, as a grown-up male, as a head of a household, as a Buddhist disciple, said, I am going to really clearly focus on everything in a three-foot circle around me. All of my effort is going to go to making right what is three feet away from me. What's well, that's probably here. I'm going to unstop that. Here we go. If you do make a circle, that's not quite three feet. My arms are not that quite that long. But if you say from here around, everything that comes within three feet of me is my concern. Things beyond three feet from me, I can think about, I can have an opinion about, I can't directly affect them. I'm going to put all my effort in dealing with situations within a circle, three feet around my body. And towards those things, I'm going to be kind and do no harm. And if you say, well, what does that mean? You say, well, you know the golden rule. Everybody has the what is the golden rule in Chinese? Huang Jin, the golden rule. Huang Jin Gui Ju. There you go. That's it. Golden rule. The golden rule is Ji So Bu Yu Wu Shi Yu Ren. That's it. But in, in the Confucian voice of it, it's interesting because it puts it in the negative. It says, things you don't want to have done to you, don't do to others. Um, the golden rule in, in my interfaith circle, we've got a there's a, a United Religions Initiative CC, Cooperation Circle, that focuses entirely on the Golden Rule. They say it in every tradition, in every language, from Farsi to Urdu, from you know, Swahili to Ubuntu to, uh, to English. And they put it on a chart, and you can see there's like, they have 40 some versions Every culture has a golden rule, which says, walk in the other person's shoes. You want to know how to directly affect the war in Ukraine? Put the other person's shoes on and do nothing that you don't want. Don't do it to others. And flip it over, and things that you enjoy, give them to others. Doesn't fail, never fails. Every culture on, on the planet understands that part. So he does no harm. You think, well, what, how does that affect Ukraine? It directly affects Ukraine because we are connected and ripples that I do go out. Um, if we allow hatred to send out ripples in my community, um, Hatred lives. Hatred wins. If we don't allow hatred in my mind 
where I have some direct control, and you could even say three feet around me, although I know some people who would say three feet is too far. Just a square inch, they say, which is your mind, my next thought. If I am kind to all and do no harm in my own mind to myself, if I don't beat myself up when I make a mistake, if I never say things like stupid, you know, you don't allow hateful speech, harmful speech, angry speech, then the world you live in is a peaceful world, a world that is harmless, and it radiates, it shines. And everybody you touch in your life will be touched by that. And then they can pass it on, pass it forward, pass it along. You know. So, uh, I don't know, that's, that's one quick answer. Um, there will, this, the war in Ukraine currently won't be the last war in our lifetime. And who knows whether, where the next war will begin. Um, America has elections coming up and uh, the outcome of those elections could determine whether or not America has a civil war. And as we have more uh, weapons, more guns in America than humans, uh, something like 1.3 guns per person in America right now. Um, that could be a very bloody internecine civil war should such a thing happen. The next war could be next door. So how important is it for me to practice doing no harm right now? Doing no harm, think of it, body, don't make fist, don't, don't pick up a weapon, speech, don't curse, don't use profanity, and fundamental to all of it is mind. Don't think hateful thoughts. Disarm the nuclear weapons in my mind. If I can really do that and live that way authentically, and even with mosquitoes that would bite me, that's a hard one. You know, do you... What do I do in the mosquito land? That's a question, you know. If you practice not having hateful thoughts, then truly your Buddhist practice has transformed the world around you. And Master Hua would say that invisibly, uh, if you can really not get angry, uh, if you can maintain a, a, a ping dong xin, a mind of equanimity around you, then invisibly, gods and dragons and eightfold pantheon, Tianlong Babu, draw near and protect you. So how good is that? You know, it's not. This is not esoteric Buddha Dharma. This is daily stuff, and we know it. We know it. We know. And boy, it. A lot of it depends upon how we were raised. Uh, if in our homes. Um, dad or mom or grandpa or grandma had a bad temper and were allowed to, to shout and scream and terrify everyone at the breakfast table, at the dinner table, uh, in the car, ooh, it's when that energy rises in us, it's easy to just do it because you saw it. Somebody set you the model. But understand here, once again, what's the Buddha's solution? Buddha says, towards all, she is kind. She does no harm. This is the Buddha's recipe for someone he wants to be his follower. His followers, his shramanas, his, they go to the ashram, right? They take refuge in the Buddha. They become the Buddha's followers. They are kind and harmless. They practice ahimsa. Ahimsa. I didn't even talk, talk about diet, did I? Yeah. Not elated by joy, but not troubled by distress. That's a powerful line. What is it like to, when happiness comes, you don't go crazy. You don't, you know, wang xing, as she would say. You don't forget your nature and become so, you know, overjoyed by happiness that you just forget everything else. And trouble comes, you're not cast down. This is real Kung Fu. 
This is Kung Fu. Um, remember the wonderful story? Wonderful story, wow. Um, this is a great one. I haven't told this one for a long time, but I, now is the time to tell it. Uh, Marty, Professor Verhoeven, who lectures on the Avatamsaka Sutra on Friday nights, Saturday nights here in Australia, Saturday afternoon in Australia. Um, he, before he became a Buddhist monk, practiced martial arts. And his teacher was our dearly beloved uh, Master Jiang, Jiang Yinzhong, Jiang Shifu, uh, who created the Wu School of Chinese Internal Martial Arts on San Pablo Avenue in Berkeley, California, and then it moved up to El Cerrito. So uh, Jiang Shifu and Jiang Shimu, his, his wife, uh, who was equally beloved by generations of students, they introduced uh, the best of Chinese culture, virtue culture, to all of us. And uh, Jiang Shifu, was, it was, they said it was a, you know, uh, a dojo, a martial arts studio, but they taught so much more than that. They taught art, painting, they taught tea culture, the value of tea, Chinese medicine, and Arlene, the master Jiang and Jiang, Madam Jiang's daughter, uh, carried on his medical practice to this day and is, is uh, saving lives with her medical skill. Um, and in fact, is, uh, Arlene has gone on to, to be uh, a trainer of other doctors and a certifier. So she's now teaching others her medical skills. So um, back in the early days, I was a graduate student, and uh, I'll have to I'll tell this story short because it, it goes long. Um, the One Wu School was about, was having its grand opening. And I was, uh, I lived in Albany, where the, that school was located on San Pablo Avenue. And I knew about the grand opening, but I had a previous invitation to go to the Pomo Indian Strawberry Festival, which was happening up in Ukiah, California. Talk about a small world. The city of 10,000 Buddhas had not even been imagined at that point. Uh, I had not even met Master Shenhua at that point. And I knew about the Wu School, and I had the invitation, and I chose to go to the Strawberry Festival because my chances to meet Pomo Indians were rare, more rare than my chance to meet a martial artist master. So I went to the Pomo, the Strawberry Festival, in Ukiah, when the city of 10,000 Buddhas was still the Mendocino State Hospital, still had years to go. Anyway, so I didn't meet Master Chiang, I didn't meet Marty, he was there, I would have met him earlier, I didn't meet him. Anyway, so, one Wu school opened up and was teaching martial arts. And uh, there, this was in the earliest days. And one night, they were practicing their Taiji forms and, you know, and uh, doing their single whip, anbian, you know, and pushing hand, cloud hands and, you know, all the beautiful moves. And uh, a drunk comes staggering through the door of the studio. And he's an angry drunk. And there on San Pablo, San Pablo Avenue used to be the strip between San Francisco and Sacramento. And so the politicians would come out of Sacramento and do their, you know, dirty work uh, in Albany on San Pablo with there were roadhouses and brothels and gambling dens and everything. And then they would cross the bridge, take a ferry into San Francisco to the Barbary Coast where uh, it was even hotter. So this was the, the place out of town where you could safely do your deals before you went to San Francisco and vice versa. So anyway, back to the story. So bars on every side of the one with studio and this guy came stumbling out of the bar and uh, comes into the, the, the martial arts studio and he's, he clearly doesn't know where he is but he's ready for a fight. And he's like, what are you doing this crazy Asian shit? <laughs> Spits on the floor, you know. 
Oh, come on, I fail. Show me our move. I'm going to see what you can do. Oh, God, I see. And, of course, all the students are like, oh, oh. Master Zhang is, he can kill you with one finger, you know. He's, he's, no, nobody's pushover. And they don't know what's going to happen. They're all partly terrified, partly excited to see how Master Zhang mops up the floor with this guy. Finally, they can see the application of their moves that they were practicing for health, right? So, okay. So, Master Zhang says, Ah, oh. he says, uh, so you've come, huh? Okay, good, glad to see you. Okay, everybody, out on the tennis court. Let's get those basic exercises. Come on, let's hop it up, get out there. He says, Futong, take, take the guys out and start them with the basics. And the studio's empty. And this guy's like, where'd everybody go? Where, I, I, was, I didn't see nothing, you know. And so the, uh, you know, the guy, the guy stumbled off into the night. And about 10 minutes later, Master Zhang says, okay, coast is clear, let's all go back. And everybody went back into the studio. And that profound lesson is the way the Buddha teaches us to deal with situations like that. Master Zhang, not elated by joy, not troubled by distress, everything's okay. He had nothing to prove by beating up a drunk. That's not what you use martial arts for. And he taught us that, he taught them that way. Then I learned from Marty as the, the next generation, uh, was that the purpose of martial arts is health and longevity. And the best martial artists are the long-lived ones. The, uh, if you're a hotshot martial artist, you have a short lifespan. There's always somebody faster. There's always somebody bigger. There's always somebody better than you. Doesn't, doesn't matter. So if you go off, go around showing off your stuff, you're going to meet bruises and broken bones. So happiness doesn't make you giddy. Trouble doesn't bring you down. You can stay pingdang, in the middle, impartial. That's real kung fu. So that's, you know, uh, actually, interestingly, uh, one more time here. The, uh, Master Jiang's, uh, his explanation of the very best martial art to practice, Chinese calligraphy, Shu Fa. He said, Chinese calligraphers are truly martial artists and they're the longest lived. And this is someone who knows, he's seen everything from gar camel caravan guards to, you know, illiterati who were poets and painters. So from the toughest to the most refined, he knew. And he said, Chinese calligraphy, it is absolutely a martial art. He said, you are taking your breath, you are taking your senses, you are taking your spirit and putting it together in the tip of the brush where it meets the paper. And he said, if you, anyone who understands Calligraphy this way can truly, truly see the quality of your Gong Fu in your calligraphy. Because that's really what it is. And we're like, what? Handwriting, sure. Who? No, no. He said, no, this is, this is profound martial arts. And he would do it. We would watch him do his calligraphy. And he, you know, his, his chi was focused on the, and his, his calligraphy and paintings were treasured by people who knew, who could really, who knew what they were. So, uh, anyway, back to, back to our shramana. Okay, patient as the earth, she can take what comes. There you go, can take it. That's what the Buddha taught. For this reason, call the shramana. Right, one more time. She li en ai, chu jia xiu dao. Shi yu zhu gen, bu ran hua yu. Ci xin yi qie, wu suo shang hai. Yu le bu qin, 
，风苦不欺，能忍无地，故号沙姆。From the Agamas, Uhan Jing. So this is the Buddha's description of what he wants in a disciple. I really like that poem. That's a great one. Okay. Back to. Let's see. We need a little bit of a. A digestive after the. Happen to have one. It's right here. Uh, and, uh, mm, uh, mm, uh. Not that one. It was this one. Okay, what is it? This is Bodhisattva's vows. This is that from the first stage. This is extract from the Abhidhamsaka first stage. They there were ten levels of vows, and after every one, this was the refrain. This was the the、uh, the chorus. Vast and great as the Dharma realm. Ultimate as empty space to the ends of future time. Throughout all numbers of eons, without cease, without cease, without cease. So you make a wish and you say, "How long is this wish going to last? It's going to." You're a bodhisattva. This is how great it's gonna last. Here we go. Vast and great as the Dharma realm, ultimate as empty space, to the ends of future time. Throughout all numbers of eons, without cease. After the story, back to the verses. Here we go again. Right there. They rule over Jambudvipa. They teach and transform beings, without exception. They enable those beings to abide in grand generosity, and from there, accomplish the Buddha's wisdom. Okay.、Uh, as I was looking at the Chinese, I thought, I wonder about that translation. Take a look here. Do it word for word. Tongling Yan Fu Ti. Tongling to put in order. Yan Fu Ti is Jambudvipa. That's a Sanskrit word transliterated into Chinese. 
Tongling, they, they rule over Jambudvipa wisely, clearly, carefully. Hua Xing Mi Bu Qi. There, as I say, they teach and transform. They, their teaching practices none not reach. Okay, so as they teach all living beings, everyone is bingo, boom, right on. Just the right time, just the right way, just the right amount. Perfect. The person who is being taught goes, oh, you bet, I will, I agree. I, I, thank you, I, I needed that. What else? Jieling Zhu Dasha. Here we go. All made to abide in big renunciation. This word for word. So, all brought to, allowed to, enabled to rest in, live in big giving. They enable those beings to abide in grand generosity. Okay, check what this says. The bodhisattvas are enablers. They make it possible for beings to stay in a state where they feel generous. They, they give them the power to be benefactors. <laughs> they give to them so they can give. Okay? Ling, Zhu, Jie Ling, Zhu Dasha. All those beings that these bodhisattvas teach are given the tools and the, the wisdom and the means to practice giving, to practice generosity. How cool is that? Right? Mm. And I'm, I'm, what comes to mind is Master Hua saying, our teacher saying, uh, city of 10,000 Buddhas is not mine. I prepared it for you. He said, as long as you, the only criteria, the only catch is you have to follow the five precepts when you're there. So you have to cherish life without killing. You have to cherish material without theft. Cherish other people's belongings. You have to cherish relationships without adultery or promiscuity. You have to cherish integrity without lying or false speech or harsh speech. You have to cherish wisdom and not drug and, and intoxicate yourself. If you can do those five things, and those are fundamental to most religions, most religious systems, city of 10,000 Buddhas is yours to practice any way you want to practice the Dharma or your own faith. We, my very first Catholic mass was held at city of 10,000 Buddhas. Um, our branch at Berkeley was home to Hokmat Halev, the center of the heart, uh, which was a Jewish renewal in the tradition of uh, Reb Shak uh, Zalman Shakter Saloni, Shalomi. And uh, uh, Avram Davis was the leader for years. We were the home of Hokmat Halev until they found their own center. And, you know, so the point is, he meant it. Master Hua said, come, I'm giving you a place where you can cultivate any way you want and people do they can all of the various practices suppose you like to do you're a karma yogi and you like to grow things we have an organic farm where you go and make you know make the ground produce things that people can use so yeah true that's what master hua he enabled people to Abide in grand generosity. And I like this last line. And to accomplish the Buddha's wisdom from there. To go from giving to Buddhahood. There are chapters in between. There are steps in between for sure. But that's giving is a door. It's called up a paramita, a way to cross over. Beyond, you can get to the other shore through generosity. How about that? I think that's very cool myself. And I want to bring up something here. Not that, but this. We, uh, this was when we went through the text, the prose, we looked at 
That's where this came about. And cancel that. Move this. Done. Okay, check it out. How do we give? Now, this is a challenge for the translator. Haha. -ha. I don't know if Chinese has all these, I'm sure it does, all these subtleties, but in English. So, lessons in giving. Different degrees. What kind of giving do we do? Look at. That's the kind of giving we do. <laughs> Whoa, so many. We give stuff away. We throw it out. We dispose of it. We, in Australia, you don't do that. You bin it, right? Let's bin this. It's trash, okay? That's stuff you don't value. The, the stuff you just, the sooner the better, you know, apple cores, get rid of them. What else? We donate things. Hand-me-downs. Okay, we'll close. Salvation Army, St. Saint Francis de Paul, St. Vincent de Paul. All those different ways of sharing things that you have right now. Um, I heard that even in the town of Mariupol right now that is under shelling, that you can show up and there are places that are outfitting you with clothes. Uh, it's still functioning, trying to keep the, the survivors going in, in the bitter cold of, of Ukraine. Distributing, let's supply vaccines. You have a lot, you want to give it fairly, equitably. Passing things to someone. Paying, that's a way of giving. We pay for a therapy session. We pay for gasoline. We pay for groceries, right? What about the giving of yielding? When you say, oh, I was fighting with you, but you know what, you're right, I agree. I give in. What are you about imparting? There's a word, there's a word, a giving. Bread baking, how to change a tire. You impart that knowledge, okay? Presenting, the chancellor, the dean stands on stage and hands you your diploma when you cross over, he presents you with that award. Awarding medals to servicemen, service women, right? So awarding and presenting, not a lot of difference, pretty much the same, but still a different sense. Bestowing, passing down, quilting patterns from the clan mother, Materials, how to do needlepoint, how to do cross stitch, how to do embroidery, how to do weaving. We bestow that knowledge. Transfer, we transfer merit from recitation. Sharing, extra piece of blueberry pie. Refraining, giving by not doing it. You don't gossip. You don't participate in harm, in evil. That's profound giving. Offering. Now, notice how we've kind of gone up in the value of giving. Now we're offering up something that water, does water have value? Well, if you're thirsty, yeah. In that same city, Mariupol, I've heard that everybody is getting sick because there's not enough, the water to drink is not good. And the invading troops are cutting off the water. So uh, compensating for, contributing to charity and benevolence. Look at all these different ways. This, these are human actions. These are the best things that humans can do is sharing material and knowledge and wisdom and kindness and uh, fearlessness, courage under trouble, right? So, yeah. However, Samantha Bhadra Bodhisattva says, good man, Shananza, Zhu Gongyang, Zhong Fa, Gongyang, Zui. The gift of Dharma is the highest kind. This includes, what does Samantabhadra Bodhisattva mean when he says the giving of Dharma is the highest kind? He says, cultivating according to instructions. In other words, doing what the Buddha tells you, doing what your teacher tells you, doing what the sutra tells you, that's fa gong yang. That's the gift of Dharma. Benefiting others, benefiting beings, helping other people, that's the highest giving. Right? Think about the, care, the caregivers in a time of pandemic, those frontline medical personnel benefiting, saving lives. Okay? The offering of gathering in beings, giving people who felt abandoned or adrift or anomie or people who are like, 
alienated from their culture, from their time, from their clan, from their country, and saying, here's home, come back, stand on your roots. That's, you know, gathering in adolescents, teenagers who have gone astray, bringing them back and showing them the value of connecting to the clan. That's an offering of Dharma. Diligently cultivating good roots. Jinshu, Qingshu, Shan, Gen, Gongyang. So any kind of wholesome practice, making it a practice that you adopt, doing it over and over, diligently cultivating, give that to the Buddha. Doesn't take any money, doesn't require you to be wealthy, but you need to, to say, I'm going to put my life into this practice and use that as my offering. The Buddha says, I'll take it. Shanzai, Shanzai. Not forsaking the deeds of bodhisattvas. Bhusha pusa hung gongyang. That's the that's the highest kind of offering. Keeping to the bodhisattva path. Bu li puti xin gongyang. The offering of never renouncing the resolve for bodhi. Look at that. So okay. In the Dharma, this is the highest kind of giving. You want to give according to Dharma, do it this way. Right? Wowee, look at that. And again, doesn't, you don't have to be wealthy. You don't have to be rich to do this. You can just do it with your body. Do it with your mouth and your mind. Then Samantabhadra goes on to say, if you want to compare, the, this, the giving of Dharma is the highest. Why is that? Because the Buddhas honor the Dharma. Cultivation according to instructions, yi fa xiu xing gong yang, creates Buddhas. When a bodhisattva, when you make an offering of dharma, you have just accomplished offerings to the Buddhas. Cultivation in that way is a true offering, a vast and great supreme offering. Okay, then we have one of those refrains. When the realm of space ends, when beings are no longer, when karma is over, when afflictions end, my giving of offerings will end. However, realm of space, the realm of beings, this is jin, 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 gongyang jin, jin. let's see, how does it go? he says. That's how it goes. So, this is one of those, in other words, never. My, my offerings are always going to continue. So, that's, that's the giving in Buddhism. And my point in making this list is just to say, we've got lots of ways to give. Lots of giving. Look at all the different ways of giving. And we do it every day. However, there is a kind of giving in the Dharma that's unique and special, and it's giving with your mind, your body, and your mouth. Sometimes it means not doing things, and the Buddha likes that kind of giving best. That's the best kind of giving you can do. So, ya, yeah. hallelujah, bodhisvaha. Um, I wanted to, to share some thoughts here. I, uh, when you look at um, something like the war going on, the invasion of Ukraine by a, a madman and all the suffering, uh, your, my heart is moved to want to help. You know. And you look at you know, what am I doing in comparison to the suffering that this is the first internet war uh, we're able to see directly the things going on and so I ask myself what am I doing personally just you, what are you doing and my answer is I'm a storyteller I'm a, uh, I tell sacred stories I, I've pretty much devoted my life to uh, the, the technical term is propagating the Dharma of the Flower Garland Sutra. That's, that's, what I, that's how I identify my 
meaning, what gives my life meaning, is that I share the stories and the teachings of the Flower Garland Sutra, of the Avatamsaka Sutra. And if I had to say what is that, I would say it's the Bodhisattva path. And not that I'm a Bodhisattva, I am a teller of stories of Bodhisattvas. I am carrying forward the, the literature and the lore of the Bodhisattva path because I think it's the most valuable body of learning that humanity has come up with. If more people knew about the Bodhisattva path, we would live in a different world. Our world would be a world where those ripples of kindness would go out and touch the hearts of more people. And in that way, we would have fewer wars. Big wars, shooting wars, where armored vehicles with heavy cannons mounted on them cross the borders into a sovereign nation. That's big war. But the big war comes from small wars, from acts of anger and hatred at your kitchen table, in your car, uh, on the phone, on Twitter. So if we can, you know, I can't stand in front of a tank that's in Ukraine, but I can refuse to scold or use hateful language, hate-filled language when I'm talking to people. I can refuse to think hate-filled thoughts at small-bodied creatures that irritate me. Drop dead, you rotten little, you know. Uh, or want to take a, a bug bomb and spray a spider and kill it because I saw it. That, that's an act of hatred, full of energy, of, of death. And somehow, it, for me, uh, I can easily connect the, the Buddha's message. Uh, what did he just say about shramanas? He said, he shu yu zhu gan yan li zhu yu. What was the, let, let me get it right so I remember it, because like I'd like to uh, be able to bring it out without needing the text. It was, uh, oh, wrong verse, here we go. Bu ran wai yu, there it is. Shu yu zhu gan subdues the organs and is not, what, how do they do it? Untouched by desires, literally not stained external desire. That's what it says. Okay, so it's pretty easy for me to connect the idea that when desire is allowed to be the only thing people want according to the consumer culture and according to our marketplace, our marketplace says, Indulge, get the best stuff. Doesn't matter. Our popular entertainments are all about pursuing desire, often violently. Uh, if you look through the offerings of, of things like uh, Netflix or Prime Video, Amazon Prime Video, or BritBox, there's one called BritBox that, that takes all of the wonderful television shows produced in England and makes them available for a subscription price. And England does uh, police stories and murders the best, you know. You just think of, of all of the, the cozy little murders, you know, that, that England, that the stories told in England. Um, in a country where firearms are not wi widely held, even the bobbies carried clubs until recently, right? So, they, these, it was pretty much murders. And when somebody runs amok, it's usually with a knife. It's not like the United States. So you think, in cultures like this, where we see as entertainment, violence and killing, it's a result of desire. It's a result of desire. I can easily connect the bodhi, the shramana, bu ran wai yu, doesn't pursue desires and what's next 
he is he sees all things as level and equal happiness doesn't delight him and sadness doesn't distress her that's the bodhisattva they can they they don't pursue thing, things and states thinking that they're going to be happier when they get them that's real wisdom that's real wisdom and the result is what the result is the world of the shramana is a world of peace and harmony so where desires are held to be desire includes what power desire for power that you want to be the power the most powerful you want to be the strongest the baddest the meanest the number one king in a world like that a climate of death pervades the idea that we don't pay attention to health care in the country where I grew up you're on your own but you can certainly buy a gun that's desire going to death so there's a principle here if we can transform desire we can sustain a culture of life instead that's something to pay attention to and that's right there in the dharma okay anyway so storyteller keeping alive the tradition i heard recently uh an interview in a podcast very popular well highly regarded podcast and the person speaking the one being interviewed was a highly regarded well respected teacher of meditation teacher of mindfulness and this particular individual personally is very much an activist uh she the teacher takes their meditation practice and goes out to benefit others she T- takes meditation to prisons and to hospitals and to board rooms and is very active in teaching people how to meditate which is a very positive wholesome thing but what was fascinating was to listen to the interviewers interviewing this teacher and they were playing a uh, devil's advocate do you know the phrase they were asking negative questions to see how the the teacher would respond not they knew the answer but they wanted to hear so they were they were gu yi wen nan you know they were at, they were asking difficult questions to get to provoke to they want to hear the answer so they said you know oh you're a buddhist teacher you're a teacher of meditation and mindfulness although they didn't necessarily use the word buddhist but everybody knew it was buddhist meditation insight meditation they said what do you do when people say that uh meditation is selfish that you just immerse yourself inside and pay no attention to the world and the teacher answered very adequately very nice response and then the, the next question was you know uh i've heard corporate leaders i've heard uh public relation uh, or uh, hr uh personnel personnel managers at companies say i don't want my employees to learn meditation because you take away their ambition you take away their drive they become passive they become too peaceful we want our employees to be more vigorous and innovative what do you say about that you know and and so the, again you know the the teacher responded very well and it was it was a good answer and and the uh what the reason why i thought i would bring it up today is what was most revealing was the interviewers who were not buddhists but who both had practiced their own style of meditation had only these responses when they had the teacher to interview their understanding of meditation and mindfulness and by connection buddhism was just that that what you do you meditate 
you get comfortable, you take a comfortable posture, you get to a place of peacefulness, mindfulness, and there you are. That's it. And I thought, my goodness. It doesn't sound very vital. It doesn't sound very engaged. It doesn't sound very active. It sounds passive, and it sounds almost uh, uncaring, discompassionate, dispassionate. That there's this line where kindness becomes not caring where compassion becomes just a hug and a good word and you're, I'm okay, I hope you feel better. May you be well, you know. Good intention, but nothing else. And honestly, it sounded boring to me. And I thought, let me check. What am I talking about week after week after week in the Avatamsaka Sutra? And what came to mind I thought, gee, you know, that's not the Buddhism that I understand. The Buddhism that I talk about, the bodhisattva path of the Mahayana teachings that come out of China and Korea and Japan, Vietnam, talk about a virtuous character. You want to learn to be the best possible person because when you do that, when you perfect your humanity, that's the Buddha. What about the bodhisattva who makes these vows to serve? The bodhisattva who says, I vow to give my body away to those who need it, and then those who eat my flesh will make the bodhi resolve. What about the bodhi resolve? This idea that I am going to perfect my humanity, I'm going to realize my highest potential for goodness, and the way I'm going to do that is by engaging in the lives of every living being and waiting until they wake up and I will go last to Buddhahood. Their salvation is my deepest concern. That's how I realize my potential. How passive is that? How selfish is that? And then I thought, well, let's see. Each time I came up with a new item, which is fundamental, to the Bodhisattva path and the Mahayana tradition, I kept thinking, oh no, that's the beating heart of it. Like what? Prajna Paramita. Prajna Paramita is the source of all Buddhas. That's where, you know, what do they say? Boro Bolo Mido Gu, Iche Jufo, the Chengjo, Ano Dolo, Samyao Samputi. Because of Prajna Paramita, all Bodhisattvas accomplish Anuttara, Samyak, Sambodhi. They become Buddhas through Prajna. How about that? What is that? That's active wisdom. The wisdom that crosses over, that takes all beings across. 10,000 practices. What about those? All of the myriad practices, on and on. Bowing, reciting, devotion, generosity, repentance and renewal rejoicing in others' goodness, requesting the active engagement in the sutras, requesting Buddhas to stick around, right? Dedication of merit. Oh, come on. So, what about samadhis? How do you get to samadhi? You work and work at your meditation, not simply for comfort, not simply for peace of mind, but for this keen integration of physical, mental, spiritual, and seeking the mind beyond words and thought. It's not zombie land, it's a door that opens into deepest principles of the mind. This is profound psychology. It's not boring, right? It's just, you know, the more I thought about it, it's like, oh my goodness, we haven't told our stories yet. The Buddha's wisdom the sutras and the heroism, the stories of heroes that the sutras contain. Samantabhadra, Manjushri, Avalokiteshvara, Kshitagarbha. What about the ten stages? That body of literature, that lore of salvation through engagement 
to others, the 52 stages of the Bodhisattva path and the great compassion that keeps the Bodhisattva coming back and back and back to teach even a single living being. Yeah, that's it. That's what I thought. There, that's the Buddhism that I recognize. Great compassion of Guan Yin, Bodhisattva, that devotion. Call in my name, Shun Sheng Jiu and I'll be there to help you out. A thousand hands to do it, a thousand eyes and a thousand ears. What about the mind ground? What about that place that is active and alive right this minute, never goes to sleep, never takes a day off, is always there happily to record everything that I do for good or for ill and will grow the sprout into sprouts and blossoms and fruits of every wholesome thought I have, the place where Buddhas arise, the mind ground. It's a garden. That's the Dharma that I know. And by golly, I just thought, we got to tell this story more. Because to have these uh, sensitive, intelligent, meditating interviewers uh, ask the question, people say it's selfish. What do you say? And people say it makes you passive. What do you say? You know, like, oh, man. It's simply because when the bamboo curtain in 1949 came down, the Chinese Mahayana had to come through Korea or Japan and it was still bound up in Korean and Japanese language or Vietnam. It was very successful in coming over in Vietnam because so many Vietnamese Buddhist monks made it over. If there was, if the, you know, when 1949 monks didn't leave and so except for Master Shuen Hoa and very few others who got out through Hong Kong. Master Shuen Hua was sent by Master Empty Cloud to bring the Dharma to the West. And it's a sturdy bloom, but it requires more of us to tell these stories so that uh, people can discover what the Dharma offers. My God, it's so rich. And there's so much activity, so many things to do that are not, that go beyond simply Mindfulness, present thought, present moment, right? Non-attachment. Well, that's all good, but there's more. There's more. Before, uh, let's see here. Uh, I see that our Berkeley monks are online, but before I get there, we got to uh, share something. Hope you will... Enjoy Brian Conroy's song. When I was young, my mama said to me, Son, when you grow up, what do you want to be? She said, Choose carefully and remember what I taught you. I said, when I grow up, I want to be a bodhisattva. When I grow up, I want to be a bodhisattva. When I grow up, I want to be a bodhisattva. When living beings can evolve, I'm going to make the bodhisattva. When I grow up, I want to be a bodhisattva. Now some folks want a one-way ticket to nirvana, to live in joy and peace, but I don't want to follow the path to see only one job for me, to follow the path of bodhi. When I grow up, I want to be a Bodhisattva. When I grow up, I want to be a Bodhisattva. When I grow up, I want to be a Bodhisattva. I want to rescue living beings just to share the joy that it brings. When I grow up, I want to be a Bodhisattva. 
now when you grow up you can be a bodhisattva when you grow up you can be a bodhisattva if you want to make something of yourself just cultivate no self when you grow up you can be a bodhisattva I'm gonna make the Bodhi resolve When I grow up I wanna be a Bodhisattva Like Brian Conroy, so do I Alrighty, there we go I gotta share my screen again So I can bring up The Berkeley Monastery website Let me do that uh, I should get that on a there we go. Berkeley Monastery. Let's see if it comes up. Oh, Berkeley Moms. No, sorry, that's not what we want. Monastery. There we go. Berkeley Monastery. Okay, Jin Chuan, Jin Wei Shir, you want to take us take us away here? Sure. Amitofo. Amitofo. Hi there. So, um, if you just look at the website, this event just passed, which is a sanctuary of the heart prayers for Ukraine. But you can find the recording of the event online. Um, and then okay. the next event. Uh, coming down here. Okay, next event. So our, Marty's lectures, which are ongoing on Friday nights. And then, Hold on. Just I can just keep talking. Well, so the, we I think the main announcement we have is we have the Four Fearless Hearts Pod coming up okay. March 26th to April 2nd. Um, that's going to be with Service Space and um, some friends from um, Southeast Asia, especially Singapore, um, they requested us to do an uh, online retreat. And so we are doing one on the four boundless hearts, kindness, compassion, joy, and equanimity. Okay. So it's, it's been quite meaningful. So if people have the time, um, you can sign up and join in. The okay. other items that we have are just our regular BBM schedule. So Great Compassion Mantra on a regular time. Stephen Tainer's class, but just our daily schedule starting from 4 a.m. to 5 a.m. morning chanting, uh, 6, 15, 7, 15 meditation. Over who sure has a sutra lecture on yep. Friday afternoon there, 12.30 to 1.30. Yep. So it's enlightenment. Um, let me, I'll, while you're on there, let me say um, yeah. that um, we, we're coming to the end of our uh, ten, 10 stages in the first stage. We need to choose the next topic, and I, ideally, it would be from the Avatamsaka Sutra. So um, we're open to suggestions. And if Jin Chuan Jinwei, right off the top of your head, what do you recommend? Ha ha! Put you on the spot there. Or the next section of the Avatamsaka to explore. Or yeah, what what's what to lecture next? Hmm. Um, I, I mean, what's really a wonderful text, which is Samantha Bhadra's Practice and Vows, we've done that a few times. Yeah, exactly. This is same um, came to me in my mind. The pseudonymous, I don't think we've done yet, right? We haven't done pseudonymous. The pseudonymous, that, that's, that's, that's chapter, that's one third, that's one quarter of the whole sutra. Yeah, it's, that's a very long, I don't know if it could be selections of, of certain good and wise advisors, but that's a very, um, wonderful narrative yeah yeah okay so that's what i just wanted to get the sampling of your first thoughts so uh we can now like uh open up formally open up if uh currently anybody who's listening on youtube if you want to type in any suggestions jerry will happily pass them on likewise from uh cliff if you want to ask any of our nishangwen woman ting 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 woman uh, 那个, 这个, uh, 讲经, 
Nida Kampa. All right? We'll take into consideration everybody's suggestions. So, okay, is that, is that good? Yeah, that's pretty much it. Just a regular schedule, which is a lot of Dharma. So if you want to plug in, please do. And if you have the time and you want to jump in even more, we have a retreat coming up March 26th to April 2nd. Very good. Okay. All right. Great. Okay. Thank you for that. Now, um, as uh, many people have removed their, their masks um, in the United States, it's... Uh, the rates of COVID infection are dropping rapidly. Here in Australia, it is not the case. Um, Australia is now a hotspot, officially. And this is a shocker because up to January, we were, uh, there were almost, you know, none, uh, next to none. Uh, cases in the single digits and stuff, except Sydney uh, had trouble because it's the, the largest city, of course. Now, uh, I've heard today that there are even variants of the Omicron have, have arrived in New South Wales. So, um, so there's lots of, you know, we're, we're still under major attack by the virus in Australia and New Zealand. So, um, just to say, uh, when we transfer merit, I'm going to bring us back to Medicine Buddha's mantra to remind us. And, okay, Jennifer says, stories of Sudhana. Okay, uh, another vote for Sudhana stories. Uh, yes, that's, I uh, would love to tell, it's called the Ru Fa Jie Pin, the, the chapter on entering the Dharma realm or merging with the realm of reality, um, the realm of totality. The problem is the first half of the chapter is everybody gathers. So there's lots and lots of verses, lots of praises, lots of the earth spirits praise, the crop spirits praise, the river spirits praise, and you know, the sun, the sun and moon, Surya and Chandana, you know, it's like, it goes on and on. Then Manjushri Bodhisattva comes down to the realm of humanity. Manjushri's arrival is a big deal in the Avatamsaka and in chapter 39. Then Sudhana shows up and Sudhana's arrival is, is a big deal again. And Manjushri Bodhisattva praises Sudhana and the praise he says, here is a tsai fa chi. This is somebody who can hold the Dharma. And it goes on for pages, right? And then Sudhana responds. He says, may I ride in that carriage, the great vehicle. It's, there's a wonderful uh, Ford Motor Company ought to pick up that translation. May I ride in this carriage. Sudhana over and over again says, yuan wo zai si cheng, yuan wo zuo si cheng. You know, I want to ride in that vehicle. So then, okay, after all of that, there's all this preparation, you know, page after page after page. Then Manjushri says, Shananza, you need to go south. And there's a teacher in the south, his name is uh, Hayun Bichou, and you go ask him how somebody cultivates the Bodhisattva practices, how they walk the Bodhisattva path. He will tell you. And you have to go now. And Susan goes, oh, do I have to leave you, Manjushri? Yes, go, go, go. You know, and so he starts out. That's the first visit. Fifty-three visits later, he gets back to. Well, actually, fifty-one visits later, he gets to Maitreya. Maitreya enlightens him. He gets to Manjushri again. Manjushri reaches his hand out, rubs the crown of his head, sends him to Samantabhadra. Samantabhadra says, "I'll answer your question." That's chapter forty. So, it's vast. And if we started it, we would have to add a lot of lectures. You guys would be getting a lot less sleep if we were to do it uh, adequately. It would take years, right, to do it well. So, but just to say, it's out there. It's a possibility. What about Ye Mo Tengong Pusa Shuo Ji Pian, shorter than Sudas? That's a possibility. Ye Mo Tengong Ji Zhang. Yeah. 
That's the praises in the, king, in the Suyama heaven. That's prior to the, the 10 practices, and that's one of my favorites. We could consider that. Marty is currently doing Pusa Wen Mingping. The Bodhisattvas asked for clarification, and that's a wonderful chapter, but he's already doing it. We probably shouldn't compete. I'll consider the Yemo uh, Jizanping. Well, to be continued. Okay, we got two more lectures of our 10 stages and then we'll be done. Okay, thanks for the suggestions. Let's pick up our transference verse, which is the Medicine Buddha Mantra. Um, transferring for those still suffering from COVID worldwide. And should you decide that you want to transfer instead to the suffering in Ukraine, go right ahead. It's your merit, your virtue. You choose where you want to send it. Okay, here we go. should have said this much earlier, but especially for listeners in China, next week we are starting an hour earlier. We have reached tonight, all of you listening live in California, set your clocks ahead tonight, daylight savings in America. And we correspond to 7.30 p.m. in California as our anchor time. So that means here in Australia, Taiwan, Singapore, Malaysia, Vietnam, Canada, wherever you're listening here, it's 12.30 from next week. We started at 1.30 while California was the other way. California's going back. So we're going to go an hour earlier. 12.30 will be our new starting time. Okay, everybody clear on that part? Let's bow here to... Oh, share the screen give you Buddhas to bow to. Okay, here they are. Make three bows to the Buddhas. Second bow. Third bow.
bow in respect to the venerable master. Just let me bring Shurfu's picture up here. Okay, that's going to do it for us today. See you all next week. Omitofo.